Hello everyone, we are today at the Panzer Museum Munster with a former Leopard 2 A6 scanner and we talk about what everyone gets wrong about laser range finding. Because, well, you did this in real life and we also have uh, basically a gunner, how you call this, joystick for laser range finding for a Leopard here. Yes, the thing is with the laser range finder and the laser ring is what many people don't get. The laser actually is like a cone, you have to imagine. It's not like a beam, it's more like a cone. It's not like a pinpoint beam, yeah. Yeah, so the more far you're away, the bigger it gets. And often you have the situation that the tank or a target is smaller than the beam actually that you get. For example, a tank is behind a hill, so you have the hill in front of you and when you're lasering, you're having the problem that you get the echo from the hill and then when you're firing, you would hit the hill. Same is, for example, when a tank is standing inside the forest or behind bushes and stuff like this. On the other hand, it can be when the tank is in the front, the beam is too big, it goes past the tank and you get multiple echoes from like behind it, like behind buildings and stuff like this. And those can cause problems to the vehicle. And in, what many people don't get it with this, they are playing games like War Thunder, where you just press one button and you get directly the distance to the thing that is directly in your crosshair. But in real life, you have like this cone. That's why you have in your optic like a circle. The circle is roughly the size of the cone. Depending on how smaller the target is, obviously the circle is bigger compared to the target. And you have to decide as a gunner if you want to use the first echo that comes back to your vehicle or the last echo that you want to use. As example, if you have a tank that's standing behind the cover, behind uh, trees, behind bushes, you don't want to have the first echo, you want to have the last one. Because the first one is actually the hill, the second one is the tank. But you can only choose between two echoes. Basically. Yes, and I, I will show you for it. This is uh, the part that is used to aim with the Leopard tank. And this is a replica used for the simulation called Steel Beast. So this would be basically standing like this, right? No, you have it uh, flat actually. You're oh, flat. Yeah, ah, you're, yes. you're sitting okay. behind it. You have like a lever here that you have to press to actually move the gun. If you don't press this side lever that is on the side here, nothing will happen actually. It's everything is on both sides. You can operate the tank completely only with one hand, either left or right hand. You have the dynamic lead here. That's another part of the fire control system. And over on the top, you have this laser. And with this, you can either select that you want uh, to turn it to the inside. When you turn it to the inside, you have the first echo. If you turn it to the outside, you have the last echo. So you want to laser a vehicle that is standing in front of obstacles, you want to take the first echo. If you have targets that are behind an obstacle, you want to take the last echo. Same goes, for example, if you want to engage a helicopter with, let's say, the modern high explosive round because it has the airburst capability so you can actually deal against the low-flying helicopter. You want to have the first echo, not that you get like obscures from clouds and stuff like this or some random stuff or arrows or because it doesn't get any uh, response from it. So you have to decide which echo you are using and there are like rules for it, when and which situation you have to choose which echo and that's one part that you learn in the training. Is there also the possibility to take the average or basically you get, you get, I guess, if you select one side or the other, it, it puts the distance in the targeting computer? Yes, it automatically takes the, this echo that you select, either the first one or the last one into the firing control system. But you also have like the two other capabilities that you can use a pre-programmed one, for example, 2,500 meters, and then you just use this in case that you can't laser because obviously some tanks have laser warning receivers. For example, more modern Russian tanks have it, so they get the notification if you laser them. And in these cases, you can engage them without lasering. But, but could you also like just say, okay, I take f f the first value and I see the value and then I take the second value and then I take the average of it? You would have to do this manually. You would uh, get the information in your optics, the distances, and uh, you can then program a distance manually into the fire control system with the other device in the tank. So you could take, okay, I take the last echo, but I, I take like 100 or 50 meters less. Yeah, but when you think of 50 or 100 meters, the drop that the yeah. round makes in this distance, it doesn't affect it that much. It's set that up to a distance from like 1,000 meters, you don't even need to laser because of 1,000 meters, the drop is uh, so slight that you still will hit the target directly. So you mentioned uh, laser warning systems that, for instance, the Russian, but also I think Polish T-72 variant. At, le at least there's something I read 20 years ago when I did my army service. Because I remember I read something, that, uh, I think a T-72 upgrade for, for the Polish tanks. 
And they mentioned also a laser warning system that immediately fires off, I think, the, the smoke discharger, but could be from memory, so it could be wrong. So wh what do you know about these? Yeah, so laser warning receivers were actually a thing already in the Cold War. For example, the T-55 AM-2 had it already. And these systems can, more modern systems can even detect if it's a range finder from, from except, uh, for example, a tank, but also if it's a laser from like a beam riding missile. So they can even say to you, yeah, you're getting engaged because it's a missile that's lasering you and not just a range finder. But the thing is, it gives away your position. If you're like even perfectly covered in a position and you're lasering it, this tank, the crew doesn't even have to spot you. He doesn't even need a thermal imager or stuff like this. He gets the notification from which direction he gets lasered. And so he knows you are there, even if you're perfectly hiding. That's why you often have to pre-calculate distances and use manually and not lasering. And those systems work in different ways. I mean, on one way you can like have an automatism that the turret turns automatically to the source of the laser, so you can engage the source of the laser. For example, an ATGM is often slower than a round of a tank, so even if the ATGM gets fired, the tank can turn to you, can kill you before you can guide the ATGM into the target. In cases if the shooter is sitting next to the missile, of course, because they are like separate systems. And on the other hand, there are systems that are like working together with like a protection system that you can deploy smoke, reverse out and uh, get into cover. Uh, these systems only work with ATGMs because when a tank ranges you uh, putting smoke on you, you won't get far away from it in this time. The APFSDs will need to travel to you because sometimes the ATGM will need up to 10 seconds to reach you actually, so you have time to react. And uh, those are the reasons why we see laser rangefinders more and more deployed everywhere, even now with the Bundeswehr is getting trialed. And uh, for example, Israel also used them on Merkavas, and they are present now everywhere because this effect that you have with the dangerous ATGMs, with getting lasered, it gives you so much more information and awareness, even when the crew, let's say it that way, uh, sleeped for a moment and didn't saw it that they will get engaged. That gives you like some moment that you can react. So one, one question for me, would you also use the, the laser basically to determine the ranges of a terrain you're going to be defending? Because usually in, an, in a situation where you know, okay, I'm going, I'm going to defend this area, then you would, in, let's say in the old times, you would then like walk up and okay, say, okay, this tree is 300 meters away. Um, this house is 500 meters away and nowadays you basically could do this like you drive into the position You know, okay, the enemy might be here in five minutes, but he can't see us now We use the laser rangefinder to determine the, the different points at a distance And then we we know okay if the enemy tank is there We don't have to use the laser rangefinder. We already know what distance is. Would you use that? Yes, it's actually trained So okay. that's that's the way you're doing when you're getting into your uh, defensive position Obviously, it only works with defensive positions that you start to draw like a map, but more not like a top map, but from your perspective, that you draw like the horizon, certain areas like some buildings, trees and stuff like this, and you measure the distance. For example, this house there is 1,500, or this crest, and you're going mostly with uh, points where you expect the enemy to come from, where you couldn't see him before, like coming over a crest, coming around the corner, coming through a forest that you have the edge of the forest. So you have these informations, and in case you get engaged from there, for example, from tanks that you know that have laser range finder, like most modern Russian tanks would have, that you don't have to laser them, that you don't have to give away your position, that you can dial in the distance yourself, for example, 2,700 meters, and you can directly shoot because you know this house is that far away. And yeah, it's completely done. It's, uh, I mean, it gives you more accuracy compared to the older systems that were used previously without laser range finders but it's, uh, it still didn't change, that you still do this, uh, and uh, it's called uh, Gelände Skizze. Ah, yeah, yeah, the, the terrain, how is Skizze? Figure, basically, as a better word for it. Yeah, and I think it was done, um, Gelände Taufe, I think, was it some word? Yeah, the, 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 the Taufe is basically that you're naming stuff, for example, ah. that's, that's often uh, something that... Gelände Taufe means uh, directly translated, um, baptizing the terrain. I, I think... naming, rather. Yeah, naming. naming. So that you have, like... Uh, you have the communication, you have to know inside the tank, mostly between the commander and the gunner and otherwise. And uh, when you get into a position, normally the commander takes the controller of the tank. He goes from left to right and uh, tells the gunner how stuff is named. For example, red roof building. 
as example, or black roof building, or funny oak, that's example. So everyone knows how market points, uh, so points that you can't uh, miss are called. And if you spot something, for example, as a gunner, you can tell tank next to red building. And then everyone knows at the red building, because the red building is the one on the left, there's a tank. And everyone exactly knows this position. I think I remember somebody dropping a comment about this whole thing and I think he noted they used very interesting names for, for, for this naming procedure and then a high officer showed up and complained about it and he said, well, we don't care if we complain about this because this is how our soldiers remember it more easily and this is how it works. So you, you might not use red building or something or red roof building, but more explicit names or so depending of course on the unit. Yeah, it's, it's up to the crew actually that, that sees it because you have to think about that like the officers also don't get to know this yeah. terrain. They could look at the map and maybe they don't know that this building is not visible from this position, but the tank that is at the end in this position, he knows what yeah, is yeah. visible and what not. And it might also have a distinct shape from a certain position that you immediately look or once it's named, you, you can't uh, forget it and then you immediately remember it. Because also in a combat situation, there's stress and so you want to have it easily remembered and not some complicated name. Yeah, especially it's like with uh, funny shaped trees actually. That they are like trees that are formed because of a strange way because they were hit by a lightning, for example, and uh, were split, that you have uh, such uh, things that you will remember because you, there's only one tree that looks exactly like this. The witch tree over there. Yeah, like witch tree or that tree and there are so many funny ways that you they get and it's completely depending on the commander of the tank, what he decides in this moment then, when he tauft das Glenn. Yeah. <laughs> uh, anything to add from your side? Not, uh, not to this point. Okay. Yeah. Then, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you to the Panzermuseum Munster for inviting us. Thank you for watching and see you next time. Bye.